Hi everyone. Happy Friday. I don't know what day it is anymore, but I do know today is Friday because it's book club day. Um, and this week we read Bonjour Tristesse, which is one of my favorite books. I read it when I was 17. It's about a 17 year old girl, um, kind of about youth and change, the changes we go through being young women. And actually the writer, Francois Sagan, was, she was 18 when she wrote it and published it, which is so cool. And uh, it actually was a huge book in France at the time. It took her only like seven weeks to write it. And it was a big hit, but it was also super controversial. Like it would have been banned in the US at the time that she published it. So, um, but yeah, I, I just really connected to the book when I read it to the main character, Cecile. And uh, I hope you guys did too. And this week is an extra special week because I got to merge my book club with Mark Jacobs um, and they're launching an open book series with their bookstore in NYC called Bookmark, which I go to all the time. It's one of the best bookstores in New York. They have everything, um, including super cool books like this, Bonjour Tristesse, that maybe not everyone has read. Um, and we're having on their friend and writer, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie is gonna talk to us about Bonjour Tristes. I know she's a fellow fan of the book and also just about being a woman in writing and um, a creative force. So yeah, we have a good, it's a good week guys for us. I hope you guys read the book. Um, I got to read it again. I loved reading it again. It also weirdly, as I was reading it connected to kind of what's going on in the world you know a lot of the book almost the whole book takes place kind of like in this house um where the woman in the book Cecile who's 17 she's not leaving she's just kind of there spending her days with herself reading studying doing things that I think a lot of us find ourselves doing finding like little pleasures in kind of the quiet moments that we're all having right now so yeah um, but before we talk to Stephanie, I wanted to read some of my favorite quotes, just cool themes I found in the book, stuff like that. And hopefully I can try to take some of your guys' questions, because I know it's hard doing lives to, like, find the questions. I'm new at this, but I feel like I'm getting better. So, um, let's start reading quotes, and if you guys have questions, please ask them. So this is the first quote that I really liked. I pulled it from the book, and it's on attraction. And um, Cecile says, I do not know if the desire to attract others comes from a superabundance of vitality, possessiveness, or the hidden unspoken need to be reassured. Um, and there is something very true about that almost need for reassurance, especially being a young woman, kind of seeking that kind of reassurance in outside forces as you learn to love yourself. And I think that comes with age, kind of like that reassurance you get from yourself. Um, there's another quote on pleasure that I really liked. It says, for this was the round of love, fear which leads on desire, tenderness, and fury, and that brutal anguish, anguish which triumphantly follows pleasure. Um, and it's also true, like, I think when you're young and growing up, kind of pleasure is so fleeting, and it feels like what follows it, the almost come down of it can feel very, um, angering or it's very intense and we start to feel things very intensely at that age of 17 and um i think that francois did a really beautiful way of capturing that i also think there's something super special about women capturing women and that's a theme we'll talk about later but um yeah and then there was another one on naivety which is a really interesting concept for me because i don't think naivety has a lot to do with age i think it has a lot to do with you know each person individually um, but there's a really great, great quote in the book and it says, I am obliged to resort to some expedient like lighting a cigarette, putting on a record or telephoning to a friend. Then gradually I begin to think of something else, but I do not like having to take refuge in forgetfulness and frivolity. Instead, I face my memories and fighting them. I think that's also really a great quote because we all tend to distract ourselves from our feelings and... Um, right now, I think we're all probably experiencing that we have less distractions, less ways to distract ourselves from these feelings, and kind of figuring out ways to face them and process them is super interesting, and that's what Cecile in the book was learning to do at the time. 
So I kind of find that that was a common um, theme without the book. If you guys have questions though, I would love to answer them or also just bring Stephanie right on and we can talk to her. Um, or if you guys had great quotes that you found, because I just pull quotes when I read all the time um, and this book has so many, like I also, there's an interview if you guys haven't read it, that if you read the book and you really liked it, that Francois did in I think the Paris Review. And like her answers in this interview should be a novel themselves. She's so well-spoken, so smart, so wonderful. Um, I can post the link on my story if you guys want to read it, but I really enjoyed reading that. After reading this book, you kind of get a better understanding of her. Um, do you guys have any questions? Please, shoot, fire away. There's also a really great movie um, that they made after the book came out and I highly recommend the movie. It is in French, but um, subtitles. Everyone's asking what the name of the book is. The name of the book is Bonjour Tristesse. Um, and it means hello sadness, which I feel like a lot of us have felt that. Um, yeah. Someone said, what do you look for when choosing a book to read? Honestly, I feel very fortunate to have a lot of friends who like to read. So, and my mom loves to read. So I feel like when I have like people to go to, um, to get book recommendations and it's super amazing. And also I know like if I want a philosophy book, who I'll go to. If I want a really great self-help book, who I go to. If I want a really great romance novel. Um, someone said, who is your favorite character? Ooh. I have to say Cecile, I think just because I related the most to her. Um, there is something really lovely about Anne who plays one of the main uh, women characters in the book. And she has this really incredible intelligence about her and this really like unapologetic way that she speaks. Um, and I really admired her character a lot. Someone said, what book are you reading right now? Well, we have a book coming up this week that I'll tell you guys about, and it's really good. I started it today, and I think, um, I think you guys are really gonna like it, and it's super of the times. So I think you'll see that when you read it. Mm, what was your opinion on the father's character? Hmm. You know, the relationship between Cecile and her father in the book, I think, is something super special. Um, their ability to be alone with each other and kind of, I feel like this common understanding that they have for each other is really beautiful and it really shows. I definitely think he is a flawed person, but what I admire the most about his character is that he admits to being flawed. He doesn't try to put on a front and try to be somebody that he isn't. And he's super honest with Cecile. And I think that was, that played a super big role in her growing up and being mature because he didn't hide or shield her from those things. And I think that formed a really incredible bond between them. I saw more questions. Um, ooh. <laughs> oh my God, Bill, thank you. <laughs> I got Charlotte to read and this is really thrilling. And Charlotte's father, Bill, is on here, and he said thank you. Um, did the character stay in your mind after you finished the book? Absolutely, and I think that's a testament to a really incredible book, is when the characters stick with you, and you can kind of continue developing them after you read it in your mind, and that's what this book did for me. Um, and there were some like brutal honesties that we all kind of feel and I think in a way this book feels like a diary where it's stuff that maybe feeling she has that she doesn't want to tell everyone that she's feeling maybe selfish or, you know, kind of outrageous feelings that you have when you're a young woman or young man that you don't always vocalize and she just tells them with such truth that it kind of forces us all to stare at ourselves because I think we've all kind of felt certain ways that she portrays in the book. Um... Any poems or books you really love? Well, actually, the name of this book, Bonjour Tristesse, comes from a poem. I think Stephanie's going to share some of the lines from that poem with you guys because it's such an incredible poem. And Francois really liked that poem. I think that's why she pulled the name of the book from here. 
Um, all right, well, should we bring on Stephanie? Like, I'm really excited. I've never met her before. I think this is gonna be really cool. She also, she has a her debut novel coming out in September. So maybe we can do that for book club when it comes out, which would be really cool. Um, and she's already written a memoir. She's very, very intelligent, very smart. Um, and I will try to keep up with her. So let's bring Stephanie on here. If we can, if we can find her on here. This is the, this is the kink that I'm still working out guys. Okay. Like I feel pretty tech savvy, but then when it comes to this, I'm pretty useless. So just bear with me. I apologize. Let's find. Okay. I think we, I think we're doing it. We're doing it sort of. Okay, I'm having technical difficulties. I'm definitely adding Mark, Mark's Instagram. I feel like a dad, you know when dads like take photos and there's always like half their finger in every picture? Um, that's how I feel right now, like a dad. And I shouldn't, cause I'm technically a part of the generation that should know how to do this. Um, okay. We're getting there. I'm doing this definitely the hardest way I possibly could, so. A lot of you requested to join here. There we go. I'm so proud of myself for this guy. <laughs> this is massive. Hi. Hi. <laughs> We did Sorry it. for my inability to use technology. No, what's up? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Are you in New York? Ah, uh, yeah, I am. How are you holding up? I'm good. I'm good. I, I put on a little lipstick for you. I'm ready. I know. I'm very impressed. I literally was like, <laughs> should I wear red lipstick? And then I was like, look, I haven't had jeans on in a week. I think putting on clothes in general is a big step, but I'm very impressed with the red lips. I mean, I couldn't get past the sweatsuit, but I got the red lipstick. So that's more than enough. I think I'm like wearing most of the time when I'm like filming these, I'm in like boxers, but I just do like the top half, half of my totally. look presentable. Um, but thanks for coming on. No, That's thank so you for awesome. having me. Uh, so you've read the book. Yes. How old were you when you read the book? When I first read the book, I was, I was 19. Yeah. And um, which I guess is like pretty much the perfect age. How about you? You were? I was 17. So they're like, yeah, okay, so thing. exact similar thing. Um, and I read it, I actually grew up in France. So I was reading it. Oh, wow. um, in at the time sort of with that in mind and um yeah tell me what your initial thoughts were when you read it i mean i really felt connected to cecile just because i think there's something so honest about the way francois writes her um and i like sat down and read it in a day i was yeah so, and you can just tell kind of the manner in which francois wrote it was like it's meant to be read as like a whole um and i i loved it but i wanted to ask like do you think that age, the age in which you read it, do you think that played a role in how you perceive the book? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think the thing that I love the most about it is that, and you kind of touched upon this, is that she writes as if, um, you know, she's totally non-judgmental, but she's mm -hmm. super aware of herself and super self-aware, and she tells mm -hmm. it exactly how she sees it, but also maintains this distance, um, which is really interesting, and sort of has this ability to like tell everything like it is without casting any judgment. Mm -hmm. which feels kind of, you know, good when you're sort of trying to figure things out yourself. Absolutely. Like having um, preconceived ideas, I think when you're figure still figuring out the world and your role in the world, um, I think can be dangerous. So it's kind of good. I think the way she just like tells everything as it is. And then you kind of see her figure things out. It's almost like her stream of conscious is like being written throughout the book. And that's a really cool process to see written, I think. Totally. And I, I think that's interesting that it's like a book about her psychology in a way mm -hmm. and that she, um, you know, the whole book is like she's super childlike kind of at the beginning. She's really impulsive. She doesn't mm -hmm. really she's reckless. She thinks she's playing a game with people's mm -hmm. lives. And then that's the thing that kind of, you know, that's the thing that hit, I mean, spoiler alert, that's the thing that mm -hmm. hits her at the end. Um, yeah. 
which is like really, you know, you kind of do feel like that, I think, a little bit when you're that age. You're like super, you know, like you feel like nothing's going to happen. You're, you know, and then. Yeah, like there's no responsibility real. for your actions yeah. until that point. And then all of a sudden you start realizing that your actions have consequences, that these are people's lives. And I think also like you start seeing her feeling guilt and remorse, which actually I don't feel like come in to play until you know you are 17 18 those real feelings of remorse totally. and you, like see them start creeping in on her um and yeah that's what i i loved about this book um but you so you've had you've written a memoir yeah i mean yes <laughs> i mean i'm not sure if it can I'm be looking called at that you and i'm like you're way too young to have no, a memoir no i'm not sure it can be but you know what it's funny because it's actually mentions bonjour uh tristesse in the book and it talks oh, wow. a little bit about um, the idea, because the character herself is, you know, it's me, but it's also like this younger voice of me. And, you know, it's, you know, there are parts where you're like, I'm reading it now and I'm like, oh my God, like this, this girl's insufferable. You know, you're mm -hmm. writing in this voice and, you know, and there's this real idea that you're sort of just like laying it all out there. And yeah, you do sound kind of terrible, you know? And mm -hmm. I'm sure, I mean, that was the whole thing with Francois Sagan. She kind of did it with the wink, you know, she's like, I know, you know, the irony of what this sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Like, and she's telling you, I mean, the only thing she never seems super aware of is her, her privilege in the situation, mm -hmm. um, which is also, I think she does on purpose because she knows that that can also, you know, carries its own kind of judgment. So it's mm -hmm. kind of really, you know, and you get that from the Paris Review interview. Yeah, as well. 100%. And she um, kind of is saying, she's like, I realized that at the time, like, I pulled this quote basically about how she owed most of her pleasure to money. And like, that was it seemed like her love of pleasure and of the things that money could get her was like a big part of who she was and who her character was. Um, and she recognizes it, but I do agree she doesn't want to play a big role because it, it kind of then can like overpower her actual feelings as like a 17 year old woman. Totally, and then she, and then when she realizes like the cons, it's funny too because Anne sort of represents this like balanced life. Mm -hmm. And then she's like rebelling against this balanced life or someone taking away the recklessness and um, the ability to sort of be that character. And then she realizes though that like every, it could have been a good thing. It's like that, it, that sort of battle between stability and sort mm -hmm. of carefree, you know, um, yeah. living, I think is a really, as a theme you often have in books about women, mm -hmm. by women, yeah. you know? And this book was written in the fifties. So I think that it was really radical at the time because it was also this young girl who sort of when she we didn't mention but did you mention surreal the um her love interest the um the young oh yeah no dick. we haven't talked about him yet okay but let's get so into a little it. intro surreal is this um sort of handsome young sailor law student who she like <laughs> takes an interest to but she she knows she's like straight up front she's like this isn't the guy i'm gonna end up with yeah and for the time that was super radical so yeah that's what they were saying like it would have this book would not have been published yeah. in the US at the time because it was super radical. And she sort of embraces that and is aware of that. And, um, you know, whereas maybe they, would ex they wouldn't accept that like a young woman was, you know, having like a, a fun summer and just for her own pleasure and for her own mm -hmm. enjoyment. So that was kind of, you know, part of the radicality of that. Um, and, you know, her parents didn't let her publish it under her name. I they, didn't know that. Yeah, her, um, so the name Sagan comes from a Proust um, character named Princess de Sagan. And so it was like her pen name because her parents were like mortified mm -hmm. by, yeah, like, you know, is this, this what book. your brain is doing right now? And we're not yeah, like and also, it was like, you know, they knew it was probably a commentary. I mean, maybe not, but on them a little bit. And um, yeah, and then she wrote it in like seven weeks or something. Yeah, and I think she did like three hours a day and she just did it because she was like, I know it'd be hard for especially women my age to sit down and focus on something. And I just want to prove to myself that I can do it. I and read like the same thing. And then yeah. the thing about her being like, I could take a crazy trip, but instead I'm going to lock myself in a room and write a book. Which I loved. I yeah, love that her, her 18 year old brain was saying that because I, I super feel that. And like, I love that that's where she was in her life. And she, I think she like, I think her parents helped her get it published, but then with the caveat that she needed to change the name. And then it was like a runaway bestseller, mm -hmm. um, which then led her to become this sort of like larger than life character. I don't mm -hmm. know like how much, 
um, you want to talk about that, but I kind of love that about her. Like the press called her like a charming little monster. Yeah, she was this like spitfire, like like her car. She was racing cars and like going. Yeah, to she casinos. was like a wild little genius woman who was so powerful. And at the time when like women did not, it wasn't what it is now. Even the way she writes about, like she was seventeen, she was already thinking about who she was going to marry, and that's so far off from where we are now. And just like. I, I think the way that she saw herself, like the amount of credibility she gave herself at such a young age was way, way ahead of her time. And that's, I think she got this like incredible, crazy kind of reputation where she was just like this wild woman in literature, which I, that's why I love her so much. Like she just has the coolest reputation ever and she's so smart. And then like, there's like, you hear about these little stories of like Juliet Greco and her at these cafes and then she had, <laughs> you know, she was around all these different people. And, you know, it just was this kind of crazy whirlwind. And I think that that um, the way she dealt with that a little too was like acting out like that and sort of mm -hmm. just like becoming a part, you know, and then she became this larger than life. And actually, it's funny, because in the book, doesn't he call her a savage little cat? Like mm -hmm. the dad? Which calls I, her. Yeah, I love yeah. these little names. But it's also kind of sad, because women writers always get these kind of little you know, know, these kind of like little names, like, um, you know, like Clarice Lispector was like, they said she was like morbidly insensitive and well dressed. Like, there's always some kind of. Yeah. And also, you like, know, since or... when I feel like that, that's also something to be said is like, you know, you wouldn't hear them really commenting on a male author's appearance mm -hmm. when describing him. It wouldn't say and well dressed. But because they're talking about a woman, all of a sudden, like, her appearances have to matter in how you describe her as an author, which I think you know, especially in that time, like that was a serious issue that women in any creative field were dealing with. And imagine she's, and she's this young too. So it's like your chances of getting taken seriously have gone from like here to yeah. here. And then she just did it. And um, yeah. yeah, I think that's, I think that's like one thing that I really love um, is also just this idea too that, and then she made the movie. She was like on set making the movie, mm -hmm. like the photos and um, oh, it's really, you know, she had that short hair and then Jean Seberg has the short hair and it's so yeah. good. Have you seen the movie? Yeah. I, I was it. like thinking I might just like surprise you and do that because my hair has gotten so long. I was like, I might as well just like just give it a bonjour. Just do it online. Just like, yeah. And then just like show up the, crazy. the boy cut. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it's so charming. And I mean, the movie too, I think helped make the myth. I mean, like of the whole thing as well, mm -hmm. probably, it's which so is well also you know, you, it also makes me think of, you're reading the Marguerite Duras book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, she was, I always see these pictures of her on set for her movies, mm -hmm. um, sort of in a, I feel like they both had that kind of sort of, you know, like they were like, they were like overlooking their projects in this way that I really admire. Yeah, well, they just didn't want, like, I feel like, and I think Francois actually says this in, in the interview and she's like, you know, when you release a book, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you like put your writing out there, all of a sudden, it can feel like it doesn't belong to you anymore. Oh, and yeah. like, you're just relinquishing all this power to the world, all of a sudden, it's out of your hands. And then I think for them to go back and have such creative control and oversee the movies was probably a way for them to like regain control of these stories that they were telling. Totally. And I think as a woman writer, you're like constantly trying to write your own narrative. And it's gonna, mm -hmm. it gets out of control, no matter what, if you're mm -hmm. in the public eye, that happens. You know, if people create stories around stories, it's just like a natural, a natural evolution. So this like impulse to like write down your narrative and hold your narrative. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she was so young and did that and didn't let, I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I mean, being young and being a woman at that time, like she was not given any power. And I think like the way that she took it um, was so authentic and so incredible. Like she's truly one of my favorite people. But I think, yeah, just like this larger theme of women in literature in any field of creativity when your story is kind of it's like you release it and then all of a sudden people tell the rest for you and um and i'm sure as a writer it can be very difficult to give something to the world and then let them kind of do what they want with it and i mean I yeah, think how do you like, handle that i think that's the hardest thing i mean at a certain point i mean that's what's also actually interesting about francois is that um she's kind of uh, you can tell she's kind of made it her, up her mind to be aloof about the whole mm -hmm. thing like she's like i'm removing myself you'll have your narrative i'll have you know there'll be a proprietary narrative and then this is what um and you kind of have to do that and like sort of 
I mean, I think it's like also that thing that like, you never want to explain too much. Like, yeah. you know, like there's always something about that, which is also why it's kind of fun that they worked on the movies because that was another way of showing the book, but not having to actually explain or answer mm -hmm. questions about it or like. Yeah. Well, you also want to let people develop the characters in their head as well. Like I know I took like the way that I perceived a lot of the characters is probably very different than the way a lot of other people and just like, you know, if my brother were to read this book, I'm sure he'd have a very different take on it and a very different experience reading totally. it. And that's like, like the problem sometimes with having the film like sort of, you know, jumped mm -hmm. in front or whatever, you get like these ideas. But um, yeah, no, I definitely think that's, um, that's a really, you know, that's a way to sort of also maintain control of the images that are associated mm -hmm. with the yeah. work. Yeah. Like literally, like we use the still from the set, like, no, to, like sort of talk about the book. So it's exactly. kind of funny. It's um, so wild. And I wanted to ask you though, like th what I was thinking when I was reading this was I was like, it just, it occurred to me. I've heard you like the book, The Bad Girl. Loved, you, loved. Yeah, love that book. Mm -hmm. And that that was set in the fifties and was a girl who's 15 too. And it was like mm -hmm. all about the sun sort of, you know, making people hysterical. And yeah. I don't know, it just like made me think of that. And I was like, I wonder if she, like it was kind of like a similar idea um, and uh, putting the two together and how radical that was to have this female character who's like mm -hmm. sort of mesmerizing and, you know, in the sun and making these decisions or leading people astray. And yeah, and I grew up in Malibu, like in the sun, on the beach. Clearly, so... I, clearly I have not seen the light of day. No, this is very now. new because I live in New York. <laughs> I haven't been there. Um, Maybe I will go outside here. tomorrow. Um, no, I'm so but, happy to have the sun right now and reading this book like it made me as I was reading it I was like I can't be reading this inside I have to go into the sun right now the and sun is a character in that and story truly, I think it really is one of the main characters in the book and it plays such a role and like cast just this overall tone over the book um and the way that she talks about the sun and she even I pulled a quote about the sun that she says I realize that I've forgotten an important factor, the presence of the sea with its incessant rhythm. She's basically talking about her surroundings like they're, you know, right there with her, like they're her friends because she isn't really, it's really told just with her alone for most of the book and kind of her thoughts. And so these um, elements like the sun and the sea are playing a really important role in like the character development throughout the book. And it's also like, it's very sort of French of that moment to have her just be the one character and then have like one other character, you know, there weren't that many characters. There was mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the, and it was like sort of these basic dramatic roles as well. But I love that idea about the sun because it also, it always was like, she's like, I was laying in the sun, I was doing nothing. It became this sort of like symbol of like, of being carefree, which is like mm -hmm. what it is in a lot of, I feel like there's this very sort of, um, yeah, I mean, it's a holiday. She's on holiday. She's like, yeah, she like, wakes up and she's like, you know, makes a point to say, and I laid in bed with the sun on my back for hours. And totally. Just, like, yeah. Little moments like that throughout the book, I feel like really ground you as a reader and kind of like pull you in. And those were the moments that drew me in the most because I really felt like I was like there with her experiencing her as she just like sat there and thought. Um, and she does a lot of this like self reflecting, which is true. Like I find I still find myself doing that. I think especially being a young woman, like, we can just sit there in our own heads for so long. And especially like fantasize, now. especially like, now, we have no yeah. other choice but to do that. Um, and that's why I didn't even realize, you know, that wasn't why we chose the book this week. But as I was reading it, I realized it really applied to what's going on right now, because we're alone with our own thoughts for so long. And I think that's really dangerous as in like, mm -hmm. in like, a, in like the way sense of like, it really causes you to confront yourself. So like, yeah. it's like, a, you know, and that's like kind of what happens to her is that she's, it's almost like too, you mentioned before this idea, I, when you were first talking about the distraction, and I think that's like a really important thing and something that I, my actually, my first book was a lot about, was about like trying to have these things that you look at to like not have to be in your head. Mm -hmm. And it's like, for her, it was like, you know, as soon as Anne shows up and says, I have to do my studies, or she because she's like this kind of discreet, she's used to all these noisy people who don't let her, she doesn't have to face herself. Yeah, you don't have to think when there's all this noise going around, you can like, it takes you out of your own head. And when you have somewhere to go and some place to be and like, mm -hmm. you can, you know, and when you have to actually sit with it, which is, you know, that was a really great point that you made, which is why the book is sort of very prescient, you know, like, mm -hmm. also, you know, it makes a lot of sense that she's like sitting there and then these things happen. And then she even goes so far as to think that Anne has given her a gift mm -hmm. in the like ambiguity of the, the final yes. scene. <laughs> the ending. 
Yeah. The did you ending. feel like, so you grew up in France. Did you feel like the sort of culture that she's talking about was true for you growing up in France or was that like, I mean, I know it's a very specific circumstance for her and her father and no, I mean, there parties, definitely but... is this, no, there definitely is this culture of a certain kind. Uh, it is of a certain privilege around, you know, the summer of going to mm -hmm. certain places of certain things. Um, and I think, I think she really does capture some of the value system that you might think, you know, is involved with that and sort mm -hmm. of presents it sort of just as it is. Like her father, you know, like you said, you're like not really sure about her dad, but he's yeah. kind of great, but you're not really sure about yeah. him. And yeah, you know, and he's, you know, and that's the thing though. She like, everyone is, it's like a very amoral stance, the whole book. She's mm -hmm. not saying, she's not judging anyone. She's not judging herself. She's sort of, and that also for a young girl is like, whoa, it's kind of, you know, it throws you a curve because you're like novelists, you know, before, you know, in a certain tradition would be moralizing. Mm -hmm. They'd say like, this is good. This is bad. This is, and here she is. And she's like, I don't know. This like, is what happened, but know? I don't know. Like, yeah. and now I have no idea and nothing's binary. Like there's like, you know, there's gray and this is, you know, and I may have ruined someone else's life. I may have ruined my own life, but everything mm -hmm. is real now. Yeah, and she goes back and forth and she's like not afraid to admit that she doesn't know and that she might have been wrong. She goes back and forth by being like, one day she wants to, you know, create this whole elaborate plan. The next day, she, or even that night, she'll be sitting at dinner and she feels bad and she again goes back and then the next morning she wakes up and she's like, you know what, no, I still want to. So it's just like this very true process that we go through of like going back and forth on our decisions there isn't always a clear moral answer to things and even when there is it's like the way that we talk ourselves in and out of it especially being 17 years old totally. and growing like, up in this environment of like being surrounded by adults and being treated like an adult when maybe you haven't had all those experiences yet totally and the idea that you can take like like inaction is also a decision sort of in and of itself like when mm -hmm. she decides not to halt to like a, her plan or like mm -hmm you start to realize that everything is a decision, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, yeah. just, and it's, um, no, but that's definitely a, um, yeah, that's really a really valid point about that. Um, but I want to know also, like, what did you think about the idea of Elsa? Do we talk about Elsa a little bit? I think we should, I think we should touch a little on every character. Okay. Cause I think it's okay. fun for, there are only like five really characters, but yeah, um, exactly. Um, so Elsa is this sort of, um, She's meant to be kind of like the sort of token, sort of trophy girlfriend, right? Mm -hmm. She's like the young, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Closer and, probably um, to Cecile's age than to... Yeah, um, exactly. Age. Exactly. <laughs> She's like, you know, he could be your dad. Um, yeah. But, and then um, she, this is like the girl, they call her, I think she's referred to as his mistress, but Cecile's mom is dead. Mm -hmm. So he is a widow. So, mm -hmm. but this is his girlfriend who he brings with him. Um, you know, since he kind of has an ever revolving door of these women kind of coming exactly. in and out of his life that uh, his daughter has become pretty immune to. She seems like she's which would be used to kind of fun. Stuff. In like, I'm like, oh, that'd be like having new friends like come around yeah. all the time, <laughs> like rotation. Um, but no, and then like this other woman who was her mother's friend, which is like never really talked about. But I think mm -hmm. there is another layer to that, that it was like, this is your, you know, your, your late mother's friend mm -hmm. who's showing up and interested in your father. Who you had, she had previously taken her and kind of like helped raise her, right? And then yeah. gave her back to her father. So she had already yeah. kind of like put all of her manners in place and like helped get her pretty straightened out as she was growing up. So I think she already had this kind of like role of authority in her life. Totally. And she was, it's really interesting because they also make a point to mention that she like worked in fashion. She was like this symbol of discretion mm -hmm. and poise. And like, mm -hmm. she was coming from the city and it was like all these things that maybe she felt wobbly and sort of like adolescent and like, you know, unkempt and yeah. That well, these other women didn't necessarily make her feel, you know, not intellectual or, um, cause they were more on her level, I think. And so all they of didn't challenge her. She's being yeah. challenged and especially by a woman and she hasn't had a, a woman figure in her life. So she kind of feels like intimidated by her. And I think there's something very real about that too. Like, and she's not, you know, she doesn't, she talks about that, the jealousy between the women. And in this case, it's an easier, you know, story to swallow because it's her father, but it is mm -hmm. like an occurrence in like, you know, human dynamics. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's like, 
you know, you feel it because you're like, yeah, she's taking, you know, she's taking her father away. She's could be filling her mother's place. Like there's so much about it. You actually understand, like not, not once was I ever like, oh my gosh, this girl is insane. You're like, I totally would have felt the same way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's kind of, she feels like, you know, she wasn't threatened by these other women. She knew they weren't invading her and her father's privacy or weren't like threatening the dynamic that her and her father had and I think when Anne did that's when she started feeling um very vulnerable and like wanted to take action and be like this I can't let this happen um and I think like that's why the I think the Elsa dynamic towards the end begins to confuse me because her father does it kind of he falls into the trap a little bit of, of Elsa trying to get him back and I think that also speaks on her kind of realizing oh I actually do have power in these people's lives yeah I think that's actually that's a really good point that you make which I think is what for me was the most sort of interesting thing about it is that she starts to realize that she can sort of predict the way people are going to react to things mm -hmm. and she's like aware of the psychology of her father which is a bit which is really scary when you're a kid right because you think mm -hmm. about it you're like you don't think you have that kind of power mm -mm. And, and then, then she, all she's proven right. And she's like, oh, really? like she realizes that she was right. And I think those moments where she goes, it's so great. Like, I totally got it right. And I knew exactly how, how to push his buttons. And, I and then she's like, oh, my God, I caused an incredible tragedy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it gets really real. And she's like, oh, it's not, you know, I'm not playing dress up anymore. Like, these are people's lives that I'm really messing with. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know also what you thought of the boy, Cyril. Um, the I, boy on the sailboat. <laughs> it's funny. He reminds me so much of like this classic character from these these like films, you know, where they're like on the beach and he. I like imagine with curly hair. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like like super mop. tan comes like yeah, like he's grown. like a sort of like I don't know, maybe like a yeah, like and he, you know, they mention I think that he's a law student and he's mm -hmm. um. And it's just funny to me that she immediately, I mean, it also speaks somewhat to the psychology of when you're young. Like, she immediately is like, the second he takes an interest in her, you can kind of feel her being like, yeah, you know, like, like, you like mm -hmm. me too much, you know, mm -hmm. step away. And um, that also is also kind of though, it also betrays her, you know, her fear of an intimacy. Because he seems mm -hmm. like he's kind of a decent guy. Yeah, like, absolutely. I would root for him, you know? I was rooting and for him, too, and he's totally. willing to help and her. He takes Elsa in to help her. Yeah, and he's, he's like, like a real team player. Plan. Anything you want, the poor guy. He's like, just and he's really me. doing. And I, I think also it's interesting how she finds these kind of moments of peace with him throughout, you know, everything that's going on, which I do think is especially true being young and in love, or maybe not in love, but with someone and... um kind of being able to like temporarily pause time and kind of forget about all of the other craziness that's happening and this ability that you know being with someone that you care about has of like suspending everything else and she kind of can just forget about all the drama she's causing when she's laying there with him and it's really modern too that she's aware that she's having this love or this moment and it's not going to be forever and mm -hmm. for that time that was super radical yeah and you know, you know he's he's 25 or 26 in the book i think and she's 17, which also now is a, you know, just the, the way that they thought and he's in a very different place in his life. But at that time, being a 17 year old woman, you were already thinking about getting married. And that's, you know, she's on summer vacation and she's like already thinking about, well, he's not going to be my husband, but he could be. And I should probably start thinking about that. And you're like, well, I mean, it's just so wild that the difference in the times. Yeah. Um, and then also that she, um, yeah, it's funny how she is about him. It's funny that there's no, it's like him and Elsa are like the, the you know, like sort of the pair mm -hmm. that are like the dupes of like, mm -hmm. you know, like you can kind of pair up the characters. Like they're, and they're kind of the like the lighthearted. Yeah, and they're the paper dolls that she plays mm -hmm. with too mm -hmm. when she like creates her. Um, yeah, yeah, it's wild. And just, I think also what I really took an interest to was the way that she acts in these sort of more grown up atmospheres when she goes out with like the night when they all go out with Anne, Elsa, her dad, and she's playing this role of like, you know, she's talking amongst all the adults. And I think there is something very interesting about being a, a kid and not being treated as such um, that definitely matures you and grows you up. And I think that's probably why she started having these feelings um, probably before she was ready to because she was in an environment holding her own amongst adults. I mean, as you have had to do mm -hmm. a lot of your life. 
Yeah. Which is like super interesting to hear you see, like, to, you know, hear you say that, like, that's a point that stuck out to you because that mm -hmm. is so true. Like, you know, she's not having this convention. She's also, that's actually a really good point. She's also always with her father. So she's not with her peers. Mm -hmm. She's forced into situations with people who are always, and so actually the girls that her father brings along are kind of like her peers. Exactly. The closest she gets to it. And I also yeah. think that that's part of the reason also like she doesn't have peers so think if she was more amongst her peers that's actually because that, she's rebelling from school too she doesn't want to be yeah. in school which is why she has no peers because she doesn't go to yeah exactly and she's you know Anne's forcing her to study and she's getting yeah. frustrated because she feels super intellectual in all these other ways in her life and then it comes to what she should be focusing on and she gets super frustrated because you know there are books that she's trying to read that she doesn't understand and for her to feel like such an adult and i kind of have experienced that too you know it's like you grow up very quickly and then when you're you have these moments of reminding you of your age and it can be very frustrating or kind of very confusing trying to navigate the ways in which you matured in the ways that you haven't yet and also then you also i mean there are different kinds of intelligence and that's the thing she has acute emotional intelligence and psychological mm -hmm. intelligence and so mm -hmm. like her being like i don't want to study i mean she's also realizing that there are different kinds of intelligence mm -hmm. in the way you move through the world mm -hmm. And that's also, I mean, like, it can't be quantified, you know, like this idea that, you know, you can have street smarts, and you can mm -hmm. have emotional intelligence, and you can like, you know, not be able to write your thesis about whatever. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that you're not intellectual. No, and in fact, mm -hmm. like, sort of this, and she realizes too quickly that life isn't a game, whereas you could argue that the, the French girls who are at home working on their like baccalaureate or like, you know, studying aren't mm -hmm. actually as in life as she's sort of like mm -hmm. gone head first yeah and then you would place those people at you know a dinner that she's sitting at holding her own and they wouldn't know what to say and i think it really plays on that idea of the different ways in which we mature and how our surroundings play a huge role in that which i i love hearing you say that because you know like for example like you can have an unconventional sort of education and you can be like an autodidactic and read a lot of books and have just as much you know mm -hmm. Like, I'm really interested in, when did you start to love, you know, reading and, like, I've loved all the books you've chosen. Thank you. Um, for the I've, yeah, I've always loved reading, but I, like, rediscovered my love for it, I would say, because I, and that's why I really connected to this book, I finished school early when I was 16. I right, which is, which made me think of that, too, you know, like, yeah. this idea of having another kind of, you know, intelligence and, like, mm -hmm. teaching yourself as you go. Yeah, and so, and I was kind of thrown again into a world with mostly adults, and I was very appreciative, and my parents, you know, I always tell people, like, my parents never had a kid's table, so they always treated us like adults, and we were meant to hold our own at dinner, whoever we were sitting next to, it was like, you should know how to spark a conversation, and that came, you know, in such handy when I went out on my own, because I realized, like, yeah, maybe I didn't finish school fully, but I now can like enter a room and know how to talk to people. But I think that's then when I started doing that, I was like, but I still really want to educate myself. If I can't go to college right now, I would love to expand my education. And I realized I could do that through books and um, I completely fell in love. The first book I read that really like sparked my love of books again after school was The Stranger, which is a crazy book to start with, by the way. I don't know why I chose that one, but um, it Did really- Did you hear like... the thing about everyone's been, there's been a, such a surge in sales of um, The Plague, his other books. And... Which, craziest thing, I was reading The Plague when this all started, and I- Just by chance. Stop. Just by chance, because I had never read it. So I started reading it, and then all these, like I start hearing all these things start circulating, and I had to stop because I was like, this might be a little too close to home to read right now. It was funny when I first, because, you know, it, it slowly all started to coalesce. And then I kept reading that, you know, the sales of the book were, because we look, you know, as you say, it's another kind of intelligence. We look towards these sort of, you know, a book becomes, for the most part, I think, super, you know, I mean, there are examples that, you know, aren't the case, but a book becomes long lasting and sort of like, you know, in our consciousness, because it's telling us something or there's a reason or, you know, we can return back to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it is trippy when that happens, when you're yeah. sort of like... You're finding these parallels. Um, I mean, I'm that's why I, right I always try and think that, that, like, there was a quote, someone once said that, like, you know, you're always looking as a writer to get the me too, in the sense of it being like, oh, that happened, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. like an Ian Forster quote about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and it's just like, you're like, I never thought anyone else felt that. And then you hear someone else say they felt it. 
which mm -hmm. I think is kind of what Cecile was for a lot of girls. Absolutely. No one was talking about it. Yeah, and no one, especially at that time, like their voices were not welcome to saying how they felt, especially if it wasn't on trend with what a young lady was supposed to feel or do or act like. And I think it was probably such a relief for young women at the time to read this and, and feel understood and seen and feel like they had a voice and there was space for them in the world to, to say how they feel. Are there other books that you have given you the same kind of sensation or feeling of recognition? Yeah, um, I mean, the book we read two weeks ago, Normal People, I just felt was very real. I love that, yeah. It's good. Very, very real and just true about kind of the messiness of being in love with someone and how it doesn't always have a beginning, middle, and end necessarily. Um, I just think she writes in a very uh, true and honest and beautiful way. Um, I mean, gosh, I'm trying to think what else. It's a hard question to be like yeah. thrown up, but I think that's, and I, I think like you that find you it in different books. It's like, even reading The Stranger, which is such a, an outrageous and crazy book, you're like, you're still finding these little moments of like, yeah, I felt that way too, or I get, I get where they're coming from. And like, that's, to me, my favorite part of reading is empathizing with all the different characters. Yeah, or like also being able to say like, what would I do? And also there's kind of also I love these, what wouldn't I do? Mm -hmm. And let's mm -hmm. see what, and that's also the whole thing of, you know, making a choice, like which direction. Mm -hmm. Each is book is like, it's like its own moral compass that you're navigating as the author is kind of telling you this story, which I think is uh, really incredible. And I wanted to ask, have you read the poem that this comes from? Yes. Do you want me to read it? To I, you? Do. I do. Oh I do. Okay. I've, I've never read it. I wanted to save it. So it's a Paul Eluard um, poem from 1932. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was, and um, what's really funny is the title is French and it means, I was talking to a friend this morning trying to be sure that I, you know, that we had the right translation. It means mm -hmm. slightly disfigured, which is also quite funny since the book is a lot about youth and beauty. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I'll read you the poem um, and I can read you the translation if you want. Yes, um, absolutely. Or just the translation. And wait, but did you read this book originally in French? I did. You know what? I read it in French also this past time because I couldn't order. I don't have it with me and I mm -hmm. couldn't order. Um, you know, it's not available electronically. It wouldn't have yeah. arrived in time, but it's not available electronically in English on like download version. So I just I just got the French. Um, Do you find a big difference it. in reading it in the original versus, versus the translation? Um, not I mean, I don't remember exactly, but I did find it. The thing I did find fascinating was that it wasn't readily available in translation. And I was like, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. You know, it's always fascinating that like, you know, a yeah. book that's so, you know, well, you know, loved or, or somehow hasn't been, I mean, I think works and that's why reading works in translation is super important because it's like getting, you know, these stories from other places. And then when you find out that, I think it's, I think there's a statistic, I have to check this, but that the United States publishing marketplace has like the smallest amount of works in translation. Which is so sad because almost all of my favorite books have been translations that I've read. Like The Bad, like the bad Girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, and it's also yeah. like you're getting, you know, and that's the, that's the way you're able to get other perspectives. Yeah. Because... And like that cultural difference is some of the most intriguing writing you can ever read because, you know, you can relate, but you also see this very big cultural difference. And that's why I think it's like so important. And I know um, Bookmark is going to carry this. So I'm very excited. About yes. Um, and so, okay. So this poem, so it starts, Adieu tristesse, bonjour tristesse, tu es inclus dans le ligne du plafond, tu es inclus dans le lieu que j'aime, tu n'es pas tout à fait le misère, car le lève le plus pauvre te dénonce par une sourire. And I'll only read you that first, because um, I get nervous now when I speak French, it's like, oh, which, by you know, the way, I took French for three and a half years, and I still get so nervous to like, speak it or listen or uh, do anything with French so I'm always like oh my god my ass like I get and then I get like clam up but um <laughs> basically it means farewell sadness hello sadness you are inscribed in the lines on the ceiling you are inscribed in the eyes that I love you are not poverty since the poorest of lips announce you ah uh, with a smile I mean it's a poem so I probably could have read that a bit I could have done a better job reading that no but it's, I mean that's a, such a beautiful poem and it's really interesting though, the disfigure, um, this kind of idea. And in the, actually the last stanza, I'll read you in English just because it's kind of relevant. Um, 
It says, love of kind bodies, power of love, from which kindness rises, like a bodiless monster, unattached head, head sadness, beautiful face. And so she's clearly at war, too, with what she looks like. Mm -hmm. And yeah. with this idea that, like, she's seeing her father also be led by, you know, again, why he's seduced by Elsa again. And she, like, doesn't really... She's like, there's, there's something very powerful, but also very scary. Yeah, like, she's... That ability I think as a she... Woman. She has the ability to recognize, you know, Anne's appeal being intelligent. She knows that, you know, the, the, she can recognize the difference between someone like Elsa and Anne, but she also sees her father's weakness. Um, and I think recognizing that at such a young age and kind of being able to be like, well, yeah, Anne is intelligent and smart, but here's young Elsa. Um, and I know my father and which is a sad thing, you know, to like, I think recognize her father's weakness in that way. But it is also a very powerful thing for her to be able to do at such a young age. And it's almost like she's saying, am I going to be an Elsa or am I going to be an Anne? Yeah. And being an Anne, I think, really scares her. Totally. And that's probably where she gets her sort of agenda to kind of kick Anne And out, in a way... Like, or sort of self-reflect. It's like she's killing off the Anne because she doesn't want that part of herself. Yeah, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the harder r route to take. But I think that's also what she realizes at the end is the lessons that Anne kind of taught her. And that she does have to sit with herself, which is kind of, again, full circle. I know, full circle, which we are all doing currently is sitting with ourselves. Um, but seriously, thank you so much for coming on and talking about thank this. Thank you. This awesome. No, I'm very excited. Fun. When your novel comes out, I really want to read it. So please. I'm please so excited know. for you to read it. I oh, would love to talk awesome. again. Thank you How for long having have me. Have you been working on it for a long time? Yeah, it's been like seven years, actually. And it's a really short book. I mean, so no, not, it's not, not the seven weeks that it's not <laughs> seven weeks. It's seven years. And it's the same amount of pages. So this, this, this tells you a lot about kind it. of gives you a false idea of the writing process when you hear she did this in seven weeks. But I'm well, well, seven years. I'm very excited to read it now. I'm excited for you to read it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. All right, that was so awesome. Um, she's so smart. I'm so happy to talk to another woman writer. I think like what a better time to do this when we're talking about Francois. Uh, I hope you guys got to read it. And also if you haven't already, I highly recommend the movie. It's super, super beautifully done and Francois saw, oversaw the whole thing. So it's, it's very much true to her vision for the characters. And I think that's really important when you're adopting something like this book that was so beloved by so many. Um, all right, well, this book will be available at Bookmark, which again, I'll say it again, it's one of my favorite bookstores in New York when this is all cleared up and we're going outside again. I definitely, definitely think you guys should pick it up. Um, it's a book that I try to read, you know, twice a year, just it's like very much brings me back to that time and, and my current time. And, you know, I even think like, when I'm a mom, I want to read it and, and to feel like a 17 year old again, it's um, really captures the essence of youth really well. Um, and also, I really want to thank Mark Jacobs for donating masks. That means the world to me. Um, you know, you can feel helpless when you can't actually get out there and, and do things, which I think we're all kind of experiencing right now. But there are absolutely still ways to help. And I've been doing my research trying to find the best ways to help. I'm so beyond grateful to Mark and his whole team for making this happen. Um, and you guys for making this happen. You know, if you guys weren't so active and incredible uh, throughout this whole thing, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So thank you so much. Uh, I will announce the book later today for next week. I hope you guys read it. Um, hope we get to talk about it. And yeah, if you guys have any suggestions of like more things you want done on this live, please let me know. I'm super open to everything. Um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Please stay busy, read a book if you want to. I will be reading. Bye.